Hello, today we are going to talk about the reading assignment, uh, Is Google Making Us Stupid? by Nicholas Carr. I'm going to try to break it down a little bit. Um, it's a long essay, but I want to show some of the connections to some of the things that Nicholas Carr is talking about, particularly Friedrich Nietzsche, or Nietzsche, however it's pronounced, and uh, Zarathustra, and how it relates to 2001 A Space Odyssey, and a whole bunch of other really interesting connections. But first, we need to talk about the essay. So uh, you can probably gather from this really long essay that Carr is worried about Google and computer technology and the changes that technology have on the brain and the way humans think. You can see this if you go to his website, look at his blog, he has written about this for you know uh, 12 years or so. It's really interesting. He provides a list of advances, that's what's part of this uh, going on in this essay, is a list of advances that show the changes uh, are always bringing about worry, uh, but, it, uh, but it does bring some sort of change. In hindsight, we can see that many of the advances that we have are beneficial. We think, how could we live without a microwave? Or how can we live without cell phones or the internet? Uh, but there was life before that. Uh, but there's always a concern about what it's going to do to us. Um, Let's see. And he never directly states whether Google is making us stupid, which, you know, kind of is a letdown. But let's look at this idea of stupid. And if we were in class, I'd say, Google's stupid. Uh, we can gather, we can get information at our fingertips so quickly. Uh, the reason why we should look up stupid is because, like most words, uh, they're rooted in something. Like the word dumb is rooted in this idea that it's muteness or inability to speak. And stupid comes from this idea of being in a state of stupor, uh, amazed or stunned. And I have my end of that um, parenthesis, sorry. Uh, we think about Harry Potter's uh, stupefy spell. He knocks people out that way, not to make them stupid, dumb, but to make them stunned. So we look at the definitions, lack of intelligence, common sense, it's a dull feeling or a dull sense, or even uninteresting. Oh, that's so stupid. You shouldn't watch it, right? So uh, are we stupid or just lazy? When we think about it, how often do we have to re-Google the same information? How often do we forget information because we know we can always look it up later? Whereas you know, 20 years ago, we might have had to memorize phone numbers. Now they are in our phone. What are we using our brains for? What information are we storing? Song lyrics? Sports statistics? I don't know. So how do we read this essay? It's long and Carr does this on purpose. He is challenging us. Uh, he could have said this you know, in a much shorter essay, but instead he's trying to prove his point. It is hard to read a long essay. It's filled with links and references on purpose to distract us. We might get sucked into the internet to learn about all these different things he's talking about. So how much time do we have to devote to reading this? Is it a challenge that we're willing to accept and make? How do we stay focused? How do we understand all these references without getting sucked into that rabbit hole of the internet? Uh, so we can start off by looking at his first references, 2001 A Space Odyssey. References HAL 9000, the supercomputer. And if you've not seen 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, I highly recommend it. Fascinating movie. It's going to seem antiquated because it's 1970s technology, but it's still relevant. And I'll explain how relevant in just a little bit. But the whole premise of the story is that uh, there's space exploration. Uh, people have to go out to Jupiter because there's an object there they want to explore. And as we know from Elon Musk and his Mars project, that it takes a long time to get out to Jupiter, which is further away from Mars. So um, all the scientific stuff, a suspended animation, a uh, supercomputer can help, help out control these sorts of things. Uh, computer goes crazy, kills people, and has to be stopped. Same sort of premise of Alien, right? Where the android goes crazy and kills people. So uh, they have to shut down HAL 9000. And basically it leaves one person left, and he's shut down the computer, which is his lifeline. And that's when the movie gets all trippy at the end, and it's uh, kind of crazy. But one of the other things that's happening is this idea of this object or this obelisk that appears in several times throughout the movie. And it marks these interesting jumps in human development. And 
that's what this object is out there. And like I said, it gets crazy, and I'm not going to really spoil the movie for you because you have to watch it and just have your head explode on your own. But there's a lot of connections. And I just jumped ahead. I'm sorry. I'm not. All right. So uh, that's not what I wanted. I'm terribly sorry. There's a lot of connections to HAL 9000 uh, that I just mentioned earlier. Uh, HAL is basically standing for all computers. The letters HAL are famously known to be one letter off of IBM, the big computer company at the time. You can see um, this little clip over here that this is the auto from the movie Wally, -E, and this is HAL. Same sort of thing, same concept. The idea of crazy computers taking over. Um, the quest for something beyond our knowledge, all these things are out there uh, in our pop culture. So uh, he also makes a lot of references, War and Peace, and you know, it's, it's kind of a stand-in for default long novel, but one of the characters, Pierre, is in this long quest to search for the meaning of life. Uh, there's a reference to Nietzsche and his typewriter, but he's a philosopher. He comes into importance later on, and we'll talk about this. We have Alan Turing, computer scientist, famous for a lot of uh, things giving us basically things that we have with our computers, but there's also a thing that's connected to him called the Turing test, which is uh, basically, uh, I don't know if it's a real test or not, but if a computer can pass the Turing test uh, with AI, then it's really developed true intelligence. And then Socrates, he's a philosopher, and I don't know why that's spelled incorrectly, uh, typo. And so we'll talk about philosophy. So two philosophers, Greek philosopher, uh, German philosopher, and then Taylor, the guy with the stopwatch streamlining work and systemization that brings us a whole bunch of other things. But then there's this long timeline. We can see uh, he mentions liter literacy through Phaedra uh, and Socrates, and this gives us independence. We are no longer dependent on other people telling us what something means. If we think about uh, nobility and clergy, they are the ones with the power and they're the ones who were literate back in you know, the early, early days. But then the printing press comes along in the 1500s, I think it's the 1500s, and that kind of creates a democratization of information. Before that, all books, primarily the Bible, had to be handwritten. The printing press allows for a rapid production of books, creating books from being this symbol of status and wealth and hoarding of information to something that everybody can have. And adds to more literacy. We have the development of the clock, right? Controlling time, that probably happened well before the printing press. Uh, the typewriter, you, now we're no longer depending on the printing press even, you can type your own missives and ideas down and print them and distribute them. Then we create the stopwatch. We might think of making ourselves slave to time. Rather than, you know, just being natural, we, you know, get up in the morning, just like he talks about, you know, we, we structure our, our lives around the clock leads us to computers, algorithms, all that sort of stuff, and then Google, ease of predictive text, things like that. Uh, that's another thing that Carr was interested in, and uh, in the blog post before this, one that he wrote in 2008, he talks about how the creators of Google would be excited once Google can not only predict text, but tell us what we're thinking before we type it, which is kind of scary. Uh, all this comes back to the idea that the tools we use shape our thinking. There's the old aphorism of when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and we become reliant and dependent. What would happen? Power goes out, we lose the internet. We lose our ability to think and know things. Um, and it brings us back to Nietzsche, or Nietzsche, and 2001 Space Odyssey. Nietzsche wrote a book called Also Spoke Zarathustra, or Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And it's also the theme song in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, so I'm gonna jump over to YouTube real quick. We can see here, this is 2001 Space Odyssey, and it's cut off a little bit, but you'll recognize the song. And here we have a monkey discovering the use of tools, a bone. So we know that theme, 
And here in that clip, you know, it begins 2001 Space Odyssey, which is a kind of a false promise. You go there and it's all about monkeys. But the idea is to show us that these advancements happen and there's this obelisk that's there every time there's an advancement. And that theme song, also spoke Zarathustra, plays. The monkey discovers a tool to use for hunting, but also for war. And it's also the title of a book by Nietzsche. Uh, we should think about Nietzsche a little bit. He's a difficult guy to understand. He's been, uh, how to say, misunderstood. Um, and I don't really know. I'm not an expert on Nietzsche, so I'll just try to do, uh, talk about him a little bit. Nietzsche's famous for the saying, God is dead. And it's kind of looked at this idea of atheism or whatever, and that's what he's promoted. And it's been a big pushback by uh, various churches and religious organizations, which is understandable, but he's not saying, yay, God is dead. He is mourning the fact that uh, our society through secularization has killed this Abrahamic God. Uh, so society and morality has been shaped by Christianity over the last thousand, several thousands of years. Um, the longer quote, and this is not an exact quote, is that God is dead and we have killed him. So we as humanity have killed him. I don't know why that W is cap capitalized. Um, but Without God, we have nihilism, the idea that nothing we do matters. So we can just do whatever the heck we want and treat people horribly, that sort of stuff. In his book, Zarathustra, he's trying to show that there can be a replacement. He has Zarathustra be this character, uh, which is also an old form of religion called Zoroastrianism, but that's way beyond the point. This is getting too long anyway. But the idea that the overman, the next step in humanity development, is, is our replacement for our current Christian God. And that's kind of similar to what's happening in 2001, a space oddity. There's something bigger, better that's coming if we let it. And that brings us back to Carr. Carr is echoing these concerns of Nietzsche, but not directly. I mean, he mentions my name, but he's not making these connections. So I don't even know if they're really there, and I haven't been able to ask him because I can't get his email address. Uh, imagine that. So the question becomes, who are we as uh, a human race, as humanity? Are we uh, constantly striving for something else? And we can look at this through work. He talks about work and systemization and how the individual processes that have been created become uh, substituted for the most efficient process. If you ever get in adult conversations, uh, the first time you meet somebody, their question is, what do you do? What is your job? And if your job is an assembly line worker, uh, not that that's a bad thing, but it's a, not something that commands respect or really shapes your identity and shows you who you are. Um, so it's kind of reducing your importance in the world. We also have computers that are thinking for us, whether it's predictive text or um, you know, Siri and Alexa listening in and, and telling us what to buy before we even know we're going to buy it. And so Carr warns us about becoming pancake people, this idea that we're kind of flat, that our own intelligence is becoming artificial. So what is replacing humanity? What is next? What are these next steps in our thoughts? We always wonder what the next big thing is going to be. Where is it? Um, so we have to end with thinking about Carr giving us a warning, or is this merely an observation? Can we really evaluate something before it happens, or can we only wait and judge once it's done? So these are a lot of things to think about, and I know this is a long uh, video that I made myself, but uh, I hope it gives you something a little to think about uh, beyond just this idea of oh boy, computers are bad. Everybody has said something has been bad in some sort of modern technology. Um, I can't even get, it, get into uh, Luddites but, uh, or Luddites, um, but that's something else for another time. But keep exploring, keep thinking, and I hope this video helps you uh, view Carr's essay in just a little bit different light. Thank you.